integrated resource plan for uh, integrated resource plan 2021 pre-filing technical conference scheduled in docket number 21-057-01, Dominion Energy Utah's integrated resource plan for plan year June 1, 2021 to May 31, 2022. My name is Eric Martinson. I'm the Public Service Commission's <clears throat> Public Service Commission's facilitator for this technical conference. We'll go ahead and turn the time now to Will Schwarzenbach with Dominion Energy Utah. Thanks. Thank you and uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, today is uh, May 18th and uh, if we go to the first slide here, I will uh, review a little bit of what we've talked about already. Uh, we've had two conferences previously, one on February 9th and one on April 28th. Uh, the last time we got together, we went over the heating season review, the system integrity update, and then a, a couple of confidential items with, with WexPro and our RFP review. As we move forward today, we're going to go over uh, some detail of our projects that are going to be outlined in this year's IRP. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about long-term planning, and uh, we're going to review a hydrogen pilot that um, is going on right now. Pretty interesting stuff there. And then uh, we'll review some of our, our future uh, step projects. So uh, that's what we have in store for today. And then uh, the, the next time we get together will be June 22nd after we have filed the IRP in which we'll, we'll present kind of highlights and, and answer any questions that anyone may have. So if there's no questions, we'll, we'll move forward. All right. I get to take you through our distribution action plan that we have. So listed here on this table, we're listing out our high pressure projects for uh, 2021, 22, 23, and then a little bit further out for our Southern expansion projects. But I'll, I'll give you a, a brief overview of each of these projects. And then at the end, uh, I'll, anyone can ask me some questions on them. The first one is our LE21 or our Lehigh 21 district reg station that sub that'll support the growth on the west side of American Fork and Lehigh. It's right near the Pioneer Crossing where it goes over the railroad and we're near our feeder line 85, which is where we will tap off. So this project again is to support that residential expansion on that west side of I-15 there in Lehigh and American Fork. The next one is our LG-12, our Logan-12 station near Nibley. It has a tap line of about 13,000 feet uh, that we're extending off the of feeder line 23 to serve the station. And it's that area, that south area of Cache Valley is just growing rapidly. So again, we need more capacity on our IHP system to support that. That project is actually currently under construction uh, probably about half of the, the feeder line extension, that tap line has been completed and we're just about to start work on the station itself. The next one is EU1. So this is a dis district reg station for Eureka that we have listed here. Uh, this is more specifically part of our House Bill 422 rural expansion project. Uh, I just wanted to have it noted here on our high pressure projects and we'll get a little bit deeper into the rural expansion on the next slide. Uh, and then last for 2021, we have Wasatch 1600, which is a district reg station meant to replace our existing North Temple station. The North Temple Station is slated for demolition in 2022, and it provides a significant amount of capacity for our Beltline system coming from the west. And so Wasatch 1600 will replace that Beltline capacity, and it's going to be installed just north of our Flyerway Station. And the Beltline team, they recently uh, redirected some Beltline up into this area to support that expansion, or not expansion, but the installation of Wasatch 1600. So that's the uh, project for 2021. For 2022, uh, we're gonna start the next phase of our Southern expansion. So the central 20 inch installation, the phase one goes from central to Veo. Uh, the entire central 20 inch project is 24 miles of 20 inch and that's why we have it broken into three phases so 
the idea for that expansion is to support the long-term demand of St. George as it continues to grow. And just so everyone knows, depending on how budgets fall out this year, there is a possibility that we start phase one in 2021. And if that happens, we will update uh, everybody through the variance report, the IRP variance report. The next project in 2022. I have a question. Sorry, Eric, with the commission. Yeah, go for it. Real quickly. And uh, maybe you mentioned this and I missed it, but the uh, central 20 inch loop phase one, the estimated cost, is that for all three phases or for just the first phase? Uh, the, let me look. So, yeah, that, that estimated cost at 32 million is for the entire uh, project. Sorry, Thank I should have noted that. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, for Syracuse 2, um, again, that that portion of Davis, that west side of Davis is growing very rapidly. I think that's just the story of the Wasatch Front right now. So we're really strung out in our regulator stations that support our IHP. And so we needed to put in a, an additional district reg station in this area uh, to support growth. Right now, I think we'd be setting it in the middle and the extension of feeder line 47, which is the next one listed, is the feeder line extension that supports Syracuse 2. It's a three mile extension and it's directly south of Syracuse 1. So this kind of gets us into the heart of the growth and we're three miles away from the nearest uh, reg station at that point, if that gives you an idea of uh, just our, how fast that area is growing away from our existing system. Then we have Wasatch 1604. This is to replace Wasatch 866. It's an existing station. We call it a doghouse. It's a high capacity post type station. And it currently sits on the side of the road and is exposed to vehicular traffic. And if we lost that station, we would actually have a pretty large outage in South Salt Lake. Uh, so we're currently in negotiations to buy some property uh, very near the existing location and then we'll install a full-size district regulator station to make sure that we have the redundancy needed there in South Salt Lake. And the cost that you see there does include the property costs uh, to acquire that. The next two projects are related. So the first one is our feeder line 13 West high pressure station and ILI facilities. So feeder line 13 is part of the overall 720 MEOP corridor effort. Uh, and we're utilizing existing projects. So feeder line replacement is going to be replacing feeder line 13 next year. And so we'll make sure that it, it qualifies for that 720 MEOP corridor. But at the same time on the west and the east ends of feeder line 13, we need to install high pressure cut stations so we have the MEOP break from 720 back to 354. Uh, on the west end for the uh, that station, we're utilizing an existing station yard, Wasatch 27. We purchased additional property to increase the size of it. And we will also be installing an ILI launcher uh, in addition to that high pressure station MEOP cut. And so the costs that you see there also include the the side upgrades and the property. On the east side, so feeder line 13, east high pressure station and ILI facilities, feeder line 13 terminates at feeder line 12, right at 900 west and 2100 south. And so we've purchased property there. And we, in addition to the high pressure MEOP cut station, we will be installing two ILI receivers and one ILI launcher. So a significant facility there. And because we're nearing downtown of Salt Lake, it was significant costs for property. So the, the costs that you see there include the property costs. Moving into 2023, so the Jamestown reg station, that would just be for redundant feed. So we have two-way feed uh, serving Green River. The Bluffdale Reg Station, we know as the growth continues to go to the south part of Salt Lake County that we're going to have to set a reg station further to the south in Bluffdale. So we're, we're still working on acquiring property and uh, where that's best going to be located. St. George, as we've discussed, is growing. And so 
what we're calling the White Dome area, which is about two miles south of our existing GE2 or our St. George 2 station, is a large development. Um, I think we're estimating well over 10,000 residential units down there. Um, and so we're currently working with the developer to acquire property and extend our feeder line down to that area and set a, a new reg station. TG5, it's an existing Kern River Gate station uh, that is serving our Eagle Mountain, Saratoga area. And it feeds feeder lines 85, 112, and 116. And we need to upgrade the capacity coming from that station. Currently, it's at 250 mm CFD. And we're, we'd like to ex expand it to 350 mm CFD. And other improvements that will come along with that will be flow control and improved over pressure protection. So we're still working with Kern River on how we can expand that capacity, whether we can expand the existing tap or if we will need to uh, tap, you know, do another tap onto Kern River to get that capacity. But we do know that additional property will be required for the additional facilities. So we are working on that as we speak. And the expansion of TG5 is really to support the residential growth of Eagle Mountain. Last year, it grew 31%. And Saratoga Springs and West Lehigh are also growing rapidly. So that is to meet the residential demands uh, in that area. And then the last project we have listed for 2023 would be a new district reg station for Eagle Mountain. Uh, that Eagle Mountain City Center area is really starting to expand to the west. And so we would look to set a station on that west side of Eagle Mountain. Um, to continue to support that residential growth. Then what we have listed is really the next years for our central southern expansion. So the central 20 inch phase two, which is Veo to Diamond Valley will begin in 2025. And then uh, for 2028 would be our last phase, which is Diamond Valley to Bluff Street. The, the last one that we have listed is our RE27 high pressure station capacity upgrade. We've had this in years past, so I didn't want to remove it. Uh, we know eventually we will need it where we, it's our separation between our 720 zone and 354. It's a high pressure regulator station and we would like to be able to push, uh, currently it can do 120 mm CFD and we'd like to increase that to 200 so we can improve reliability to Salt Lake. Again, we know that eventually we'll need it, but with past projects such as Rose Park, uh, that new gate station that's been completed up in North Salt Lake, it's moved back the timeline. And so currently working with system planning, we're trying to define the next, the date that we would need to do that capacity upgrade. So I do have one more slide, but I wanted to open it up to any questions for these high pressure projects, if anybody has any. I have two questions. Okay. This is Eric. Um, on the um, Saratoga tap, uh, I think that's feeder line 85. Correct. Didn't we just replace that a year or two ago? Uh, no, we haven't replaced feeder line 85. We did extend, there was a feeder line extension to the south for TG7, which was a new district regulator station at the south end of Saratoga. Oh, okay. Jason, this is Adam. Uh, Eric, to answer your question, uh, you may also be referring to a station that we replaced that kind of is a MEOP break uh, located in the vicinity of TG5. It was called TG3, so maybe that's what you're referring to. Oh, yeah, and that was recently, right? Yes. Okay, okay, that's what I'm thinking. Um, and then uh, finally, the with the 720 corridor, my understanding is part of the um, holdup in that is that there's not sufficient pressure from the old Questar pipeline to keep that 720 corridor pressured up. If that's true, are there negotiations with the new owner of 
Quest Star Pipeline, or is it is that not true? What I remember. Thanks. Eric, Jason, this is Mike. Can, Scott. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Um, it is true that uh, Dominion Energy Quest Star Pipeline does not have the pressure to support a 720 corridor at this time. However, I don't think that we're yet in a negotiating with a new owner situation and, and Austin or, or Jen could speak to that more maybe. So that's just down the road farther. Is Right. This is, this is a, and Adam will speak to it, part of our long-term planning, or as I still like to call it, the 75-year plan. Yeah. Well, it's getting closer though, 75 years. So like. Agreed. We may still be here then. Those are all my questions. Thank you. All right, Austin, can you take us to the next slide unless there's any other questions? Yeah, this is already, I do have one question. Your scenarios there on that previous slide focused on the Wasatch Front and Southern Utah. What about the Eastern part of the state or the backside of Wasatch, uh, Wasatch Front? Are you seeing the same type of growth or are those farther out into the future? So those are further out and Adam may have some additional numbers uh, to provide us, but we haven't seen the same growth. I think with the kind of the bust on the oil side, the Duchesne, Roosevelt, we haven't seen quite the same growth. There is an existing feeder line replacement project happening right now out there for feeder line 43 and 134. And we are setting a larger Duchesne uh, station. Uh, but that that's all part of the feeder line replacement project. Okay. So, yeah, but yeah I, we're, we're not seeing the growth on the east side as we are in Wasatch area in St. George. Yeah, as we look at the model metrics from year to year, uh, the eastern part of the of the state is not growing as quickly. Uh, this the summit Wasatch area, you know, Park City, that that type of area, it's growing at a pretty steady, uh, about two to three percent in the past several years. But uh, overall, you know, the eastern part is just uh, very, very low growth. So, yeah, that's what I had in mind was more the Park City, Wasatch, Heber area as opposed to uh, Duchesne, but. I think you've answered the question. Well, and, and just to let you know, there are several other uh, projects happening out in that area, potentially depending on developers. So we're just kind of waiting to see uh, what happens there. But I do know the feeder line 99 project that happened several years ago really provided us the, the high pressure benefit that we needed for, to sustain the growth out there. Okay, thank you. All right, Austin, on to the next slide. So just wanted to touch on a few uh, other pieces. So the feeder line replacement, it is part of the distribution action plan. We have a small section in there, but that team will be meeting with the PSC on June 21st this year, and they'll provide a more detailed report of uh, what projects they're completing and which ones they're going to be working on over the next year. Uh, rural expansion for Eureka. I said we'd touch on this a little bit more. So the IHP and the high pressure projects have been awarded to Fugel and construction is slated to start in June. So they're going to start the, the high pressure uh, main line as well as the IHP going through the city. So we're currently on track to uh, have everything flowing and ready for the heating season for 2021-2022. Uh, the large plant project, we all know about the LNG. So we know the EPC contract was awarded to Matrix on May 15th last year, and now we're under construction. And uh, a fun note, the tank roof is being raised today, which is a pretty significant milestone uh, for that LNG plant. Uh, 
the intermediate high yeah. pressure projects, yeah. these are kind of the same two bullets we've had the last couple of years. So the belt main replacement program, which is part of those tracker uh, projects, that those will be discussed more in detail again on that June 21st, but those continue to move forward with that belt main replacement. And then uh, the aging infrastructure replacement project, it's an opportunistic project where uh, we take advantage of any relocation projects or remaining budget to remove old steel that's less than eight inch diameter that doesn't fall into the belt main category or uh, other problematic pipes such as Aldelay from 1969 to 75. Uh, they continue to focus in getting rid of those uh, sort of pipe. And then the last one, we just wanted to make a note that the transponder replacement program completed in the first quarter of 2021 and has now, it, well, it's now transitioning to a regular maintenance schedule. So that does it for my slides. Any other questions on, on this slide or the previous slide? Eric? Yeah, thanks. Um, with regard to Eureka, was Fugal the lowest bid or was there some other contingency that you had to um, consider to award it to Fugal? So I, I know on the IHP, they were for sure the lowest on the high pressure. They were very low. They were, but I believe it became a resource issue and a concern about completing uh, by the heating season. And so that was the, the difference there for Fugal. But they were extremely low uh, if they weren't the lowest on that bid. I, I wasn't part of the, the award process, so I, I can't speak directly. Hey, this is this is Kelly. I uh, I just happen to have Mike Gill with me. He said that they were the lowest. They were the lowest? Okay. Yeah, and a lot of it was due to the, the mobilization costs. They're actually down, down in that area, so they were able to be very competitive for that reason. Okay, thanks. All right, any other questions? Okay, Austin, I think that's it for me. Okay, thanks. Let's move on to long-term well, planning. Like my turn to talk about long-term planning, so let's proceed. As usual, each year with this IRP uh, tech conference, we like to look at the growth and what the pattern and trend has been in, inside the entire system. As you, you can see in the table, these are the past five years of the peak day growth throughout the overall for the entire system and also our customer growth. And as you can see, for the past five years, it's been for just peak day growth, an average of 2% and 2.6% for our customer count. Next slide. I'm going to interrupt you here for a second. I, I guess I've got some feedback on my end, so I'm going to jump back over to Google and uh, mute. So if you'll sure. bear with me for just a moment. And I'm sorry for the, the feedback. Oh, where are we at? Maybe I can ask a question while you're working on that. Uh, that growth, that five-year average growth, how much, just as a guess, how much was that dampened by the past year, COVID? You know, I if you look at the, the change between 2020 and 2021, just looking at just those two years, if you want to go back a slide, Austin, uh, you'll see that we actually saw an increase in growth overall between 2020 and 2021. I, oh, I don't think there yeah. was a dampening of, at all of growth inside the state of Utah. I think we've seen an influx of people coming here and uh, d demand going up. So. Okay, good yeah, point. Just, Thank to, you. To, just to add a little color to that, over the last year, we've seen a small drop. We saw a small drop in uh, the commercial usage, but that seems to have... Uh, 
gotten back to to normal levels. And yeah, Adam's right. We I think we added like twenty eight thousand customers last year, which is a record for us. So um, no, you know, no slowing down on the residential front at all. Huh. Yeah, and uh, Kelly's right. There there were particular customers that we were aware of commercial customers that went out of business actually, and and we saw their daily contract limits drop off, but we also saw a big increase in customer growth overall. So uh, even with some drop offs, it was an, a, a huge net positive still. So next slide. And this kind of speaks to what we're expecting to see with the population change. And I'd be really curious if, if the Kenzie Gardner Policy Institute would be looking at a uh, an updated version of this projected population growth they did back in 2015, uh, looking out 50 years in the future. But uh, just because we've seen such a change in the pattern of of where people are moving to, uh, I, I think I, I imagine this number these numbers might be higher. But that's just conjecture. Uh, as you can see, for, with their 50 year absolute population increases, they're expecting Utah County in 50 years, well in 2065, to be larger than Salt Lake County almost by double. And Southern Utah is growing fast, and, and these are the kind of targeted areas where we're seeing the most growth. So this lines up really well with their uh, projections so far. Next slide. Um, I'm trying to remember who was asking about the 720 corridor, but uh, the image here on this slide uh, highlighted in yellow shows where we're expecting the uh, 720 corridor to operate. Uh, highlighted in green towards the bottom of the map from Pace into about Vineyard along our feeder line 26, that section of our feeder line is already operating at 720 pounds uh, MEOP, and we expect that 720 uh, pound corridor to continue up. But uh, as mentioned earlier, we will there will need to be some uh, infrastructure replacement. Uh, there's going to need to be made some changes on our upstream. Uh, resources in order to facilitate a 720 corridor but that's that's quiet out into the future uh, before we reach this point but this is kind of the long-term plan extending that 720 corridor all the way from pace into high road next slide as we also look at the future transportation capacity jason uh, mentioned this that last year we had uh, the installation of a, of a new rose park gate station just north of salt lake which uh, increases the system reliability. It also increases the ability for us to bring more gas onto the system in an area that's uh, it's, it's hard to you know add more gate stations to. So that was a, a big help for the system along the Wasatch Front. However, however, for the long term, we need, need to still keep our options open. Uh, we are still considering looking at using Ruby Pipeline and installing a gate station closer towards Brigham City in order to facilitate long-term growth. So that's still an option, but uh, we haven't uh, made any concrete plans to do so yet. Next slide. Another option we're looking at to increase gas supply into the, uh, the Salt Lake Valley and along the Wasatch Front is, uh, Jason mentioned a couple of projects that are happening along uh, Feeder Line 85 and the Saratoga uh, Kern River Gate Station or Kern River Gas Transmission uh, Station that we have. And the option, if you look towards that highlighted um, uh, node there on the image uh, towards the bottom and that yellow line heading to the east, that's for your line 85. And one of the options we're looking at is increasing the diameter of that pipeline uh, in order to push more gas into the uh, system in an area where that's, it's a little more challenging to do so. Uh, once again, no, no plans, uh, definitive plans have been made to do that, but that is an option that uh, we would definitely consider as, as growth increases and as we uh, see where, how that growth uh, happens throughout the system. Next slide. Now, uh, the title of this slide is Modular LNG Sites and RNG, and, and obviously we're, we're still in the process of, of getting our first on-system on storage uh, through the LNG out of Magna onto the system, uh, something that we are considering, and, and I want to be really uh, clear here, no, uh, we haven't planned any of these yet, but this could be part of the long-term strategy, is to consider constructing modular LNG sites throughout the system, not 
on the same scale as the LNG audit magnet, but perhaps it could be an option that we look at for the long-term strategy to do smaller um, LNG sites or even RNG sites throughout the, the system in order to increase sustainability, uh, but also address some of the pressure concerns that, that could arise in the future. Next slide. Um, before we move on to talking about the hydrogen pilot update, did anybody have any questions for me about what was uh, presented regarding long-term planning? Yeah, maybe this is a question, the answer I should know, but I don't. What is What does RNG stand for and what's the difference between RNG and LNG? Yeah, great question. Thank you, Artie. Um, RNG stands for renewable natural gas. Okay, okay. Yeah, I knew that. Go ahead. Yeah, and so we have a site that was installed up in South Davis. I'm right. sorry, uh, the southern end of Davis County. And uh, basically, we give them a little bit of natural gas, and they're able to take uh, renewable or generate renewable natural gas and inject it back onto our system. Uh, you know, so that's uh, basically the difference. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. I'll turn the time over to Alyssa with our hydrogen pilot update. Thank you. And um, those that don't know, don't know me, my name is Alyssa Walling. I'm a research and development engineer at Dominion. Um, in talking about hydrogen, um, a question I often get is why we're even looking at hydrogen in the first place. So just um, briefly to answer that question, hydrogen isn't a greenhouse gas, which is very inviting. And when it is burned, it doesn't emit greenhouse gases. So it's kind of nice that way all around. And so if it's blended into natural gas, it'll lower the overall car carbon footprint. And as a long-term thought that if hydrogen is being created from renewable electricity um, through a process called electrolysis, then it's renewable hydrogen being blended into the gas. So it's a renewable source there. So that's kind of, the, the inviting thing about looking into the hydrogen in the first place. Next slide. So here, Dominion, um, you're, you may be aware that Dominion Energy, the full company, has a goal to be net zero as far as carbon equivalents go by 2050. And so related to that, we've created a goal to be ready to blend 5% hydrogen um, into our system by 2030. So this phase, this pilot that we're looking at, um, we refer to it as Therm H2, um, is a really small, basically feasible, feasible um, level project where we're looking to gain um, some operational experience with a 5% blend of hydrogen in our system. And just to validate that what we're seeing in current research in the industry, um, it fits uh, within our system as well, within our distribution system specifically. Uh, we're conducting this pilot at our training facility, which is pictured there. Um, all of those little buildings, if you're not familiar, have uh, various residential appliances in them. We can uh, simulate a lot of different scenarios, which makes it really inviting to do um, a, a project like this. Um, so we're doing a lot of different tests, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Um, at, at this facility with, with hydrogen. Austin, next slide. So this is our facility where it is right now. Um, the tests that we're doing fit into four main categories. Um, we have the safety category, which um, we're testing all the different residential appliances that are in our village. As I mentioned, there's quite a few in there and they're varying vintages, varying styles and types. Uh, we're also looking at um, odorant changes to how the gas smells, as well as making sure that hydrogen isn't leaking out of places that we aren't expecting it to. Um, hydrogen, the molecule is much smaller than um, methane, so we want to confirm that it, it will stay in the pipe in places it needs to be. We'll also be doing a separate leak survey test, um, and this is specifically with our leak survey group. Uh, we'll be making sure that the equipment they use to, to look for leaks and to, to find um, those in our system 
uh, work properly, even with the hydrogen in the, in the system. We'll also be doing a specific test just for NOx emissions, um, making sure that there are no changes in, in NOx emissions, particularly in the um, increased end um, with the residential appliances. Um, and also we'll be doing tests for vintage steels. Um, so you can't see it in the picture, but um, underground we've buried um, a few different um, lengths of old steel pipe um, that will be exposed to this hydrogen blend and we'll be working, we're working with a lab, specifically um, the Gas Technology Institute to test to see if there are any changes in the material properties. Um, GTI, the Gas Technology Institute is also helping us with the NOx emissions testing as well. Are there any questions about that, that testing or, um, up to this point? Yeah, this is Eric. I have a couple of, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. uh, with the safety and the appliance operations, um, are, are you envisioning that to still be within the Wobi range and that sort of thing that the current safety uh, boundaries are? Or do you envision that altering somewhat or do we know yet so hydrogen does have um putting hydrogen in the gas will lower the low the will be a little bit but when we're putting such a small amount the the five percent in there we don't expect it to change so significantly that it'll pull the appliance out of um typical working operations okay um and are you you uh, increasing those levels up to 5% incrementally, or are you just starting with 5%? We're actually just starting with 5%. Um, the, the research that we're familiar with and aware of indicate that we shouldn't see any issues with 5%. If we were to see issues at 5%, um, then we could uh, back it off. But 5% is typically seen as um, a small amount that's not going to make much of a difference. Okay. And with the molecules being so much smaller than um, hydrocarbon, um, are there different uh, ILI tests or inline in inspection sort of things that uh, the safety inspectors will need to do through the pipe other than this corrosion material test that you were talking about? Um, I don't believe so. Um, okay. I'm not, I'm not sure that we'll have to worry about any of that other, so. Okay. Thanks, Alyssa. No problem. So I will point out my, my next slide goes into our, our timeline and schedule a little bit, but that picture in there is our facility. Um, it has, so it has been built, um, and it was commissioned, um, at the end of April. Um, so. That's where we're at now, and we actually have started some of the safety tests as of yesterday. So it's it's pretty new there. We're still gathering a lot of the data. And Austin, you can show the next slide. So you can see um, where that's at. We expect to finish up um, testing, and which includes some of the lab testing um, by the end of July, and then wrapping up this project um, by the end of third quarter. I think Artie had a question. Yes, Artie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, remind me, and I know we've talked about this in the past, but what's the short-term objective and the benefits that we're looking at from this study, and what's the long-term objective? Does that make sense? Yeah, so the short-term, <clears throat> as I mentioned, our objective is to um, confirm current research in the industry and um, gain that operational experience. And long-term, we're trying to make sure that our, our system could handle blends up to 5% and be ready to blend um, 5%. Did that answer your question? Yeah, if from that perspective, it, and that's kind of what I remembered from past discussions too, but what's the potential benefits from blending 5%? I mean, that, like you said, it's not a very, high level, so it, what are the real benefits that might be expected from 
lending 5% on the company's system? Sure. As I mentioned earlier, um, blending hydrogen into the natural gas system will lower the carbon footprint um, since hydrogen does not contain any carbon and it's not a greenhouse gas itself. Um, and, do, we, do you have kind of an estimate of by how much? Is, a, is it a huge reduction? That's a, that's kind of what I'm asking. Is Sure. Um, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, Okay. Yeah, I apologize. Bela, you had a question? Yeah, I, I was just going to follow up on um, what Artie was asking about. I was listening to a, a presentation recently, and, and they were talking about how hydrogen is uh, a third, uh, has a third of the energy density of methane. So um, uh, uh, 30%, say you had a 30% level of hydrogen in your supply, you'd only see a 10% reduction in carbon. So I, so I assume if that math is right, the 5% that you want to add would only reduce carbon by about one and a half percent or so. Does, does that make sense? Or, or do you agree? Bela, this is Mike Platt. I, I think that the energy density that you're looking at and that you've talked about, uh, is actually energy density per kilogram, not energy density at pressure. And it's a little bit different. Um, so there will be a reduction in energy density. However, I don't, I don't think it's a third when you get to blended at pressure. Okay. Well, th that would be interesting to understand because I was surprised. I mean, it makes sense. I mean, hydrogen is a much smaller um, molecule um, that would be less, that you would need more of it to be equivalent to the energy production of methane. So, um, you know, what benefit do you get in terms of carbon reduction from 5% in our system? I think it's something that we can we can calculate, and there are some charts out there that we could pull off and and maybe provide to you, Bela. But okay. um, it, it is a small percentage, but it is a reduction. And mm -hmm. and really, I think, and I don't want to speak for the industry or the the company as a whole, but I think that our research in hydrogen is really about determining how much carbon reduction we can get because we see it the future and what uh, our customers are demanding and we're trying to build a pathway to get there. So it, it may be just the stepping stone to a higher level or higher, higher percentage of hydrogen potentially in the, yes, in the future. Exactly. And, and I will say, and this is a complete aside, but there are European countries that are converting their entire natural gas system to 100% hydrogen. So, I mean, this is our first step into determining at our pressures with our pipe in our system at our elevation, you know, what, what does hydrogen blending look like? Okay. Yeah, I have one more question. Um, have you thought about where you would pro procure your supply of hydrogen? Would you, would you make it yourself, truck it in? Um, I'm, I'm just, I assume right now you're using such a small amount. It's not, not, a, uh, not an issue. You probably have tanks of hydrogen that you're using or, you know, I'm just curious if you've given that thought. I mean, I know 2030 is still a ways out, but um, I thought I'd raise the question. Yeah, you're correct. For this particular project, we just have tanks of, of hydrogen. It's, it's pretty small and uh, it wasn't worth the extra money to try and produce our own. Um, and I know that the company has talked about a lot of different options. Um, ideally, down the road, if, if we're doing blending hydrogen to our system, um, we would be getting that hydrogen that's been made through an electrolysis system, so it's renewable hydrogen. Um, but I don't know at this point whether or not we would be producing it or if we'd be purchasing it from someone else. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Welcome. I think Eric had a question. Mm -hmm. 
Thanks. Um, does hydrogen combust with the same sort of oxygen to um, to I don't know the same oxygen ratio and the same temperature, or is it different? I don't know. It it can. It does have a wider flammability range. Um, mm -hmm. So if you're just looking at pure hydrogen, it could combust um, with less um, effort than natural gas. Um, but where we're blending it, especially in smaller amounts, it, that won't affect the, the blended gas won't affect that change too much. Okay. okay. Yeah. And, and Alyssa, just a clarification point. I think that, uh, both natural gas and hydrogen will combust at about 4% blend with air. The difference is that hydrogen, pure hydrogen, not in a blend, has a much higher blend ratio that it will still burn at. So I think it's up around 70%. But in the, oh. the blended scenario, natural gas is like 45 to 14.5%. And with hydrogen at five percent it's about four and a half to fifteen percent so it's almost no change i got it thanks mike that helps oh, thank you yep. Artie, did you have another question yeah i did and you've kind of started into answering my questions one the first question i had was about the cost um how does the cost of hydrogen compare to the cost of natural gas and then the second question or part of that is, is this, especially as you increase uh, or, or go to trying to blend it on the system and you may or may not be producing it yourself, but is this a prelude to energy storage too through hydrogen? So, and I can't speak fully to um, hydrogen costs, but I do know that it depends on where it comes from, um, how much it does cost. Um, I know the hydrogen we have is was pretty cheap, but it was also pro most likely created from natural gas. Um, there are other ways to get hydrogen that are in the more renewable realm, which could probably be more expensive, um, but I don't know exact numbers on that. I'll jump in here, Artie. I, I would say right now the economics would not make sense um, if we were to try and introduce it in our system. I guess the hope is, just like any other renewable energy of the past, that over time, uh, you know, the, the cost effectiveness of it increases. So I guess right now our our thought or our strategy is to be prepared um, should the cost of hydrogen get to a more competitive level. Because you don't you don't want to you know be trying to figure all this out um, when when you're to that point. It's better to, to kind of have things figured out before that that happens. So, right, and that was kind of my understanding, Kelly. Was is that it, it, a large source of hydrogen would be fairly cost prohibitive right now? Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, and so that probably addresses the second question too. Is that if the economics change, this might be a viable way of, of storing energy on the system, but right yeah. now it's still cost prohibitive. Yep. No, I've lost track. There's a couple of hands and I'm not sure who was first. I apologize. Um, it looks like the lens I see are myself and Bela. Maybe I'll mm -hmm. just jump in with a couple quick questions, which is, um, I don't know what, what you've done so far, but um, have you have you considered the, the issue of um, leaking beyond, beyond the meter? So leaking within a, a customer's facilities and the, the potential for that where, um, just an example I have is when we renovated an old house that I own, there was some places where the original, um, the original iron gas pipes were porous enough that there were slow leaks through the pipe itself. Um, I don't know that 
that would, you know, potentially you could have a, a greater leak from a, a hydrogen component in there. Um, sure. Oh, go ahead. And, and I don't know how you would, is there, a, is there a plan to address this or sort of inform customers to, to consider this? Yeah, and that's an excellent question. The We are um, at least, we'll, I'll say, starting to address that in this project. Um, I mentioned that we're doing, um, looking for pure hydrogen leaks. And so we have just a handheld um, hydrogen sensor. Um, and as we're doing various testing, um, we've been checking um, to see if we can find any kind of hydrogen, at least at um, like meter joints. Um, and as well as inside our buildings where we have threaded joints there as well. And at least in the, the short term, we haven't found any um, any leaks in that sense. But um, as an industry, I know that there is concerns that that could be an issue. We just don't know if it's a, if it's a valid um, issue, if it will be definitely an issue or, um, or what. So that's something that, that warrants some further Lot, but we're trying to address that initially a little bit here. Okay. And then the second question is is maybe just a thought or question if you've considered this. If, if you were to convert to a large percentage of hydrogen, which has a, a fairly significantly lower energy density, um, have you done any modeling of what that does to the line pack capacity? Um, and And... You know, you, you might have a lot less line pack for those winter mornings um, if it's full of hydrogen instead of methane. Hey, Justin, this is Mike Platt again. Um, we have not done modeling at this point. I will say uh, it is a, I mean, energy density back to the energy density per kilogram. When you get into the higher blend percentages, the act, the flow mechanics of hydrogen outweigh the reduced kilogram uh, or energy per kilogram. So I, I think it really depends on what the ultimate target is in the end. It, if this becomes something that's viable, uh, economically and, and something that we want to pursue beyond research. So the, we really haven't gotten to that point, I guess, is the, the short way to answer that. Okay. I, I just, you know, kind of raise this as some of the things I've, I've read about in the industry journals about this conversion and um, not everyone has great solutions for them, but some people seem to have, have problems and others don't, I guess. So I was, kind of just curious if it's it's um, maybe too far down the road to consider that at this point anyway I think I think uh, it is something to be concerned about however so far we haven't considered even higher than five percent blends I mean I think that when we get to if, if we start looking at higher like 20 percent blends, We'll have to evaluate what that's doing to our our capacity and our line pack, um, and whether or not we want to pursue it at that level is going to be impacted by the the cost all in, and that would be included in my mind. Okay, thanks for covering that, and those are just the questions that I had. No problem. Uh, were there any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you. I'll turn the time over to the next part. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Mike Orton. I think my uh, on the meeting here, just my phone number shows up. So it's me. Um, I'm going to give the, the group just an update of what's going on with uh, our uh, step, our, our one currently approved, uh, commission approved step project, and then uh, what we envision in the future for um, the step funding. So just by way of reminder uh, to the group what, what uh, step is, it's the uh, sustainable transportation and energy plan. Um, that is, uh, it, that was, uh, 
born out of uh, House Bill 107 that passed during the 2019 legislative session that expanded uh, the, the existing STEP program at the time to the natural gas sector. Um, again, as a reminder, we uh, the, the company filed for uh, uh, our first project last year uh, for, for commission uh, consideration um, at about this time. And ultimately, we, we came to a, a settlement on that and the, uh, the commission um, approved that, that um, settlement stipulation. Uh, that, so that, that first project uh, that the company proposed was um, to fund the Intermountain Industrial Assessment Center. Uh, located um, at, in the uh, Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Utah. And um, to, so to fund the Intermountain Indust- Industrial Assessment Center, or IIAC, at uh, the level of $500,000 per year over a two-year pilot period. Um, the the IIAC uh receives um, about the, the same amount of money currently from the Department of Energy. And um, as part of their DOE funding, the IIAC is mandated to perform assessments uh, solely in the manufacturing sector. And really, they're tasked with um, with increasing the, the competitiveness of the, the United States uh, manufacturing, manufacturing sector by... Um, by uh, through um, energy efficiency improvements in those uh, facilities. So the, the company's proposal uh, uh, that was approved was to expand uh, beyond the IIAC's uh, DOE mandate into other uh, uh, businesses and, um, and specifically to to perform an additional uh, 20 um, energy efficiency assessments um, in uh, Utah businesses, uh, and then also to perform 40 clean air assessments um, per year. So that's uh, 20 clean air assessments on the DOE-funded energy efficiency work, and then uh, 20 clean air assessments on uh, the company's um, energy efficiency assessments. So they're 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 committed to doing that for um, uh, each year of the two-year pilot program. The the uh, settlement stipulation um, uh, included that the, um, the the project would kick off on October first of 2020, uh, but ultimately the the company and and uh, the IAC determined that. Due to some COVID-related issues, that the uh, um, that the that the launch of that uh, project needed to be delayed, uh, so the company sought and received commission approval to postpone that the beginning of that project to March 1st of 2021. Uh, so, just to, just an update of what's gone on since then: the um, the the project has gotten up and running. Uh, the University of Utah or IAAC is uh, fully staffed and um, is in the process of, of building a pipeline of uh, businesses who may be interested in having an assessment, uh, an energy efficiency and clean air assessment. Um, the, the, the pipeline is strong. Uh, we have about 30 um, interested businesses so far. In, in that work um, and uh, continue to get uh, referrals and, and find other interested businesses as well. So uh, we're very encouraged by that. The, the uh, IAC has also performed their first assessment. Um, that was done at a, at a Cash Valley uh, dairy um, and uh, that was completed uh, several weeks ago. Um, and the report right now is in the process of being finalized and, and um, should be delivered to that Cash Valley Dairy sometime in, in the this week, either this week or next. Um, so if, if are there any questions on what's what's gone on to date there with the IAAC program? If not, I yeah, this is Bela. Um, on the on the Cache Valley Dairy, it, would that be an RNG project? 
Yeah, I think um, it's. I think multiple things. So we we're looking at uh, at possible, you know, just efficiency improvements, but then also, uh, you know, more directly to your question, Bela, I think they're they're they also performed uh, um, an analysis of the emissions that were that that uh, are coming from that dairy as well. Okay. Thanks. Hmm. There are no more questions. I will turn it over to uh, Jordan Stevenson, who will give uh, us an update on uh, um, other projects that we that uh, that we're working on right now. Thanks, Mike. Um, just sound check. Can everybody hear me? All right. I know everybody yep. else is muted. Okay. Yep. Um, I I think I'm the last presenter today, so we'll probably end earlier than uh, scheduled. Um, but before I end, I just wanted to answer the question that's probably burning on everybody's mind as we've gone through this presentation. And that is where in the world is Kelly Mendenhall? <laughs> so I'm gonna put Kelly on the spot a little bit because I know he's somewhere interesting that uh, that he might not mind sharing. Kelly, would you would you mind if I put you on the spot? Yeah, that's that's good. And I was actually gonna, gonna uh, talk about this when you were done. So. We are, I think Jason mentioned earlier, we're raising the roof, literally, <laughs> on the LNG facility. Um, so when Jordan finishes up, uh, our technical conference will be over. But for those of you who would like to have a virtual tour of the LNG facility, I will grab the project manager and we can walk around and kind of show you uh, the process. It's, it's pretty, pretty fascinating. But I don't want to steal steal your thunder there, Jordan. So I'll let you present, and then we can talk a little bit more about LNG after. Sounds good, Kelly. Um, yeah. So I was just going to round out uh, this HB one hundred and seven conversation with some potential uh, some potential avenues we we have not yet brought forward to the commission. Um, as you know, any any uh, action we take under HB 107 needs to be commission approved, and we are exploring other other areas outside of the IIAC um, assessments that that Mike just discussed. One one potential area that we are actually in design uh, phase now is a natural gas vehicle uh, incentive program. Uh, this would be specifically targeted at, at large class engines. So uh, think larger kinds of vehicles like buses, uh, refuse trucks, box trucks, uh, like delivery trucks, um, snow removal, even as large as semi trucks or locomotives. Uh, we know that this is a, a, a ground well trodden. Um, it, it's well known that, that much of the clean air concern we have is in the transportation space um, and there's a lot of headway being made. Um, we feel like we can move the needle quite a bit by focusing on these larger vehicle applications uh, and there are some uh, good, there's good evidence there that, that we can make a difference. Um, so we are designing a program and we'll uh, continue through to a clean air analysis of that. Uh, after the design and clean air analysis is complete, uh, we plan to submit that program to the commission for approval. <clears throat> and that's all I've got to update there. Any questions? Yeah, Eric. Yeah, thanks. So I don't know that much about emissions, um, but I assume there are a lot of other things that come out of the tailpipe than just NOx. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think you're right, Eric. Yeah. Okay. And so uh, does this uh, vehicle step program you're looking at, does it control the other or eliminate or diminish some of the other stuff that comes out of the back or is it just focused on the NOx? Yeah, so when I mentioned the clean air analysis, uh, we are currently reaching out to um, – potential partners that would be much more knowledgeable about all the various components that you discuss, Eric, but we will look at all of the NOx, PM 2.5, uh, other kinds of, uh, you know, particulate matter or, or, or air 
pollutants as well. Um, and we'll include that in our analysis. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. All right, if uh, there's no other questions, um, I don't know who, who from the commission is running uh, all of the IT. <laughs> Is it Eric or? Uh, I believe or? Melissa might be running. Uh, might be running okay. it on our end. Is that is that right, Melissa? Great. Okay. So I think that concludes the tech conference. Um, right. But it would it would it be okay if you just kept the Google Meet open for a little bit and people who 